Hello everyone, um, I hope you're having a really amazing time at the BCLT Summer School. Um, it's really exciting to be here to uh, talk to you via video about how to get started in literary translation. So I probably won't have all the answers, but I want to give you a few tips and things to think about when you're starting out in your pursuit of this very fun and interesting um, and fascinating career. Um, so just to introduce myself very briefly, I'm Jen Kalea and I translate um, German language literature. I've been doing that for about eight years. Um, I've translated, I think, 15 or 16 books. Um, I've translated authors including Marion Poshman, Michelle Steinbeck, Vim Wenders. Uh, I'm currently translating books by Helena Bukowski and Raffaella Edelbauer. Um, and I started out as a translator, first as a writer in my own right. So I started as a creative writer. I then taught myself German from reading German language books um, and ended up uh, finding out that there was a thing called literary translation where you could translate German books into English. Um, and yeah, I started that uh, eight long years ago. Um, so what I want to do in this little video is to run through um, a few of the questions you might have in um, starting out in literary translation um, and, and also drawing on my own experience specifically. So like I said, I won't have all the answers, but I want to give you a bit of insight into how I got started into in translation. And hopefully that will be um, a, helpful for you as well when you're starting out. So the first big question, uh, how do I become a literary translator? It's quite a massive question. Uh, the main answer I can give is there's no one way of becoming a literary translator. There isn't a set route. There's not um, a checklist of things you need to check off in order to uh, make it in literary translation. Um, you might start out yourself as a linguist, as a non-literary translator, um, like myself, as a creative writer who then goes on to learn another language. Uh, you might have... Um, knowledge of languages from being an academic or from working as a publisher or an editor. You might have studied languages at university. You might have done a specialist master's in literary translation. Um, so yeah, primarily there's not one set way and each way will bring its own strengths to um, starting out. So that's really important to know. Um, there are three things I've identified in terms of how you really make your break in literary translation and how you approach how you want to be a literary translator in the beginning and it's really based on your own capacity and what you feel comfortable uh, with doing um, so I've, I've kind of allocated these different sections as chance uh, putting yourself out there and being proactive so say you've you've decided that you would like to be a literary translator based on the experience you've already had. So as I laid out from this whole, this whole range of reasons, you might have your languages, you know, you might have been brought up bilingually or multilingually. Um, you might have um, self studied languages like I did. Um, chance, by chance, I mean, um, you were in the right place at the right time. So you, um, someone knows that you have these language skills and you're approached by an editor or someone else um, in your kind of wider friendship group or professional um, uh, career that knows that you have these languages and might have these skills to be able to translate a book so you're in the right place at the right time and you're just asked and that can happen quite often um, putting yourself out there by that i mean you've announced to the world that you want to be a literary translator so that means you might have created a website where you say that you're a literary translator you might start telling people that you're a literary translator when you meet them. Um, and then by being proactive, I mean by, I mean, pitching, uh, writing samples and really engaging with the wider publishing industry. So those three steps, uh, chance, putting yourself out there and being proactive are all very different ways that you can approach being a translator. So it's a case of either you wait and see or you announce it to the world or you start contacting people, um, offering your services, uh, reaching out, networking, etc. So 
that's the kind of foundation of how you can get started. You can come from a whole range of different backgrounds and you have to decide how proactive you're going to be. And it might be that you start off um, slowly. So it might be your first book could be that you're asked because somebody knows that this is something that you're interested in. And then you have to then put yourself out there and then become proactive, depending on if you have other work on, if you're studying, um, it's really based on what you're comfortable with. Um, you don't have to rush into uh, pitching and sampling if it's something that you don't have capacity for in the beginning. It might take time and it, it really will take time. Uh, so the next thing is, uh, so you've decided to become a literary translator. So you've made that decision, you're making that leap. Um, and maybe you've started, you know, putting the feelers out, trying to get work. Um, I would say go for it if this is what you want to do. Obviously, you've made that commitment by wanting to do the summer school. Um, so, yeah, go for it. Put all that enthusiasm and hope and energy into being a literary translator if that's what you really want to be. I would say that it's not going to be easy. It's comparative to any other freelance job. Um, or other creative jobs like being an artist, being a freelance writer, it's um, a whole world in itself that you'll have to familiarise yourself with and it might be very different to the way you've worked previously. So it's also quite competitive because it's still quite a niche world. So it will not be easy. You will have times when you'll be perhaps working in evenings and weekends in the beginning when you're trying to get as much work done on your translations as possible um, it might mean a lot of unreplied to emails um, you have to really put yourself out there if, if you want to do this job so it's it's staying hopeful but also being realistic about um, the problems you might come across in the beginning at least um, on that note hardly any lit translators are full-time literary translators it's um, something that very few translators can do, you know, live completely off of only translating literature. But this is not necessarily a bad thing. So in my career, I translate um, German language literature. I'm also a writer. I also uh, mentor emerging translators. I give courses. I write articles. I do a whole range of different things. I also do volunteer work. Um, so it's not it doesn't have to be seen as a negative necessarily that it possibly won't be the only thing you will do in your in your career when you're being a literary translator but all the other things that you do around um, your literary translation work will also influence that work and it will um, having that variety of work will also maybe be a good thing for your own kind of mental health in terms of it being quite an isolating job that you're sitting and working on a computer all the time so it, you can see it as a bonus um, and especially when you're starting out um, when I started out I had a full-time job and would do my translation in the evening and the weekends uh, before that balance shifted so that's also something to keep in mind um, when you're approaching this as a career that maybe the aim isn't that it will be your only source of income um, and to think about how you can complement your translation work with other forms of work um when you're starting out i would say it's good to be open to everything so you might get offered a real range of different translation work you might be asked to translate book blurbs or press releases you might get asked to translate conference abstracts which is one of the first translation jobs i did um and i would say in the beginning it's great to get experience translating a real range of texts it will give you um, the kinds of experience that you might need later on when translating literary texts. Um, being able to translate different voices and different forms of text is a really handy skill. Then later or down the line, after you've gained experience in translating all these different texts, you'll be able to understand better where your strengths lie and what interests you. So it's good to be an all-rounder, at least in the beginning, um, to accept translation jobs that you might not be sure of um, but it will all be part of that training and then later down the line you can say well actually this is what interests me the most or this is where I feel like I'm you know at my best and that will help you stand out as a translator so 
when I say what I translate, I say I only, I only translate contemporary German language literature. I prefer to translate women. Uh, I also translate creative texts around music and art because these are also subjects that interest me. Um, and that's, I think it's good to be able to be explicit about, you know, what, where your strengths are. It's not um, something negative to say, no, I don't really want to or think I'm good at translating this kind of text. Um, you know, I don't often translate poetry because I know it takes a long time, um, even though I do enjoy it. So again, things like being able to weigh up what texts, again, you have capacity for and how that um, will play into your decisions of what you will go on to translate. Um, after you've done your training as a literary translator and maybe gained experience in literary translation, it could be that literary translation isn't for you. But I would say that um, even if you end up not being a literary translator, the skills that you will get from training as a literary translator are vital for the other jobs that we need around literary translation. So you might end up becoming an editor or um, a reviewer of translations um, for you know, the press or for literary journals. Um, you might go into academia um, or become a creative writer. And all those skills um, that you will have gained in your training as a literary translator, if you go into a different part of that ecosystem, you will do a lot of good in terms of raising awareness around translation, understanding better what translation is and being able to influence um, the way translations are edited or spoken about in the press or the ways they are credited and cited within academia. So if you don't end up becoming a literary translator, um, you could still go into a translation adjacent uh, field and also help uh, literary translation at the same time. So what are the key skills that I think you need to be a translator? Um, I've identi identified a few, um, which I'm aware of on a daily basis when I am translating. So a, a really important one is knowing the source language, so the, tra the language that you translate from, to an advanced level. Um, this means that you'll be able to read books in that language that you also know about the culture of the language or languages that you translate from and you know the literary culture. Um, being Knowing a source language to an advanced level doesn't necessarily mean you can speak fluently in that language. Um, you know I still find speaking in German very difficult because I learned primarily from reading so um, don't let that put you off, don't think that um, that will mean you're you're not good enough in your languages if you if you're not um, kind of that kind of level of um, linguist or being able to speak um, that well. And also, the the flip side of knowing the source language to a very high level is being an excellent writer in the language that you um, are translating into. So, for instance, English. Um, would you class yourself as an excellent writer in English if that's the language that you translate into? Um, both are equally important. You can know the source language to an expert level, but if you can't write well in the language you're translating into, then it, it means you won't get a good translation, it won't be readable, it won't feel like um, the work of literature that wasn't the original. So thinking about those two things very equally and making sure that you um, kind of exercise those muscles equally. Um, knowing the literatures and what's going on in the different lit scenes and publishing scenes in all the cultures that you are working with. So for instance, I make sure I know what new books are coming out in Germany and Switzerland and Austria. Uh, I know who is featuring on the bestseller lists, on the prize lists, um, what trends are appearing in the German language literary scenes. Um, but equally in the English language literature scene and the publishing scene. So I know again what what books are what winning are what winning what prizes, um, what authors are are most prominent at the moment, again what trends are going on. You need to be really immersed in those publishing scenes because it's not just about the books it's about where those books are going to end up where they're going to feature 
what um, you know what scene they're going to fall within. Um, so having a real broad understanding of what is being published in all the cultures that you're working with is really, really vital. You have to be reading a lot. Um, that seems quite obvious, but it doesn't mean you have to be reading every single bestseller or every single book that's coming out of those cultures, but just having an awareness of them. So I often, you know, if I know I won't be able to read um, a massive new book that's come out in Austria, I read reviews on that book. Um, I read interviews with authors. There's a lot of reading that can be done and equally doing the same in, for me, the English speaking world. So reading interviews with, with new authors and uh, authors that are publishing right now. So you can see, again, what movements are going on, what trends, what are people talking about, what kinds of books seem to be most prominent at the moment, because you need to be able to um, pitch books or, or place books in what's going on right now. It doesn't, um, it's not solely about whether a book is um, good, you know, per se, because it, it appears within a publishing culture and a literary culture. So um, it's really, really important that you read as much as possible, not just books, but reviews and interviews uh, and things like this. Um, a big obvious one is writing translations. So don't wait to be commissioned to start writing literary translations. You can take a book off your shelf of, um, you know, from the language you translate from, and you can start translating today, you know, the first page, the first few pages, the first chapter. Um, you don't have to wait, just start doing it. Um, the only time it becomes an issue is if you want to then publish that translation. You can translate as much as you want in your own home. No one's stopping you. And in fact, it's the only way that you will really learn is by constantly uh, translating. If you do want to publish um, a text that you've translated, you have to get permission from the rights owner of the original text. So this might be the publishing house. So contact the rights department, it might be the author. So it's really important um, that if you are going to publish your translations, you get permission from the rights holder, because even if the translation is yours, the original text isn't. Um, and it could be that someone else has already published a translation of this text um, and you don't want to be treading on anyone's toes. So translate all you want in the, in the privacy of your own home. If it goes outside, you have to check on some things. Um, this is a big one. As a final point, um, having confidence in what you think a good translation is. So um, again, this is something that you'll gain by reading a lot and by translating and reading other people's translations, being, um, they were being able to understand and to explain what you believe makes a good translation. How do you know when you've made a good translation? What are the criteria that you personally understand um, make a good translation. Um, a lot of people will have different opinions on this, um, but it's really important that you personally know. Um, and it's also important to be aware that you're going to have to do different roles around being a literary translator that again are adjacent to the role proper. So this means being kind of an agent for your authors, um, being able to speak to editors and say this is why this author is really um, important right now this is how many books that they've sold um, internationally in the last year these are the prizes they've won these are the things they're interested in this is what they're working on next um, also being an editor and researcher yourself so when you're creating translations you're also self-editing you're having to research um, things that happen in the books you need more information around um, so being able to hone all those different skills and again that is also a part of confidence being a confident editor a confident speaker a confident um, agent for the authors that you represent it's not just about creating the text on the page um, fundamentally you have to have an approach to how you translate so again this is about the confidence thing it's about being able to say, this is what I think translation is, and this is how I approach it. So for me, being a translator is being the teller of other people's stories. So being a storyteller. So for me, the most important thing is that I am retelling 
somebody's story to the best of my ability while being aware that I'm part of that story because I am the storyteller. And this is partly to do with having confidence in your own voice as a writer, as a translator, but also being aware of your own biases and prejudices. So this is why for me, translator visibility is a matter of ethics. I think it's being aware of our blind spots, um, how we as individuals have one reading of a translated text. Um, there's a really good quote by Mark Polizotti, who wrote a book called Sympathy for the Traitor, where he says, um, you know, no matter how much it pains me to admit it, all the translators of um, the author Modiano that he has translated, they've all, you know, created successful translations and none is better than the other. You know, his translation isn't better than other translators' attempts. Um, and that all of the translations have unavoidably infused that voice with tonalities of our own. So being aware as a translator that you are in that text, this is my opinion, you're in it, and that's something that is not necessarily a negative. Um, it can be a massive positive that you are part of that voice. Um, and being aware that no matter what you think a voice of a translator should be, there's space for your voice. So there should be a, a variety of voices that are out there in translation um, and be proud of the way that you translate and don't try and change the way you translate for other people. If you feel you have a particular way of phrasing, particular grammar, a particular eye for vocabulary choices, there's space for all of it. So um, yeah, be proud of your translating voice. Um, just to wrap up, I would like to talk for hours, but I don't have hours. Um, you know, how do you get your foot in the door? So we talked about approaches, your background, um, things to be aware of when you're starting out. But how do you really make a start? Um, so as I mentioned before, specialising, finding something that is uniquely yours um, or that you think really sets you apart from other people. Um, you can contact publishers and offer to do reader reports. You probably will be hearing about reader reports a lot. Um, again, you don't have to wait. You can contact um, editors or, or rights um, departments. Contact details are usually on publishers' websites. Um, and you can just offer to do read reports if they need them, telling them what language pairings you have. Um, and it might not happen tomorrow or next week or next month, but you'll be put on a list somewhere and um, their usual translator or reader might not be able to do it and then they'll contact you and then you'll get to to read, write a report, have a chance possibly to do a sample and be able to get offered a job based on a report and a sample combination. Uh, pitching, so if there's a book you really love and you've got permission from the rights holder first, very important, um, to pitch books to editors and again um, short and succinct um, and yeah really don't be afraid to be enthusiastic um, doesn't have to be this super measured thing the most important thing is that you know what you're talking about and you can show very succinctly why uh, you think this book could be an amazing book specifically for that publisher so make sure you do your research and be able to show that publisher why you think the book fits with them not in general but specifically with them um, a big one is get ready to collaborate with editors. So when, you, when you're going to go out there and write translations, they will be edited. So um, I would recommend partnering up with other translators or um, getting friends to have a look at your translations and get ready to have very deep conversations about changes to your translation, both so you can remain humble when people say, you know, this I don't think is correct or this needs work but also so that you are happy to argue your point when you think things don't need to change. Um, so get ready for, for deep conversations with editors. Um, yeah, finally, everyone needs different levels of help starting out. So you're at the summer school, you've made that choice to get trained um, doing this really exciting way of deep collaboration with authors and with other translators. You might need additional help. So read everything you can on translation online. These are free resources on Words Without Borders, on Asymptotes, and other publications like these. 
Uh, you might want to seek out mentoring. There are a number of translators that will do one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Um, and yeah, everyone is different, so everyone will need different support. Um, but yeah, find what you need in order to feel like you're getting the best start in literary translation. Thank you very much for listening. Have a great time at the summer school um, and hopefully see some of you soon. Thank <laughs> you.